Invest Africa, proudly brought to you by KPMG. Welcome, I'm Nozi Pombanjwa and this is Invest Africa. Now tonight we're talking the automotive industry on the continent. While the South African market looks like it's in trouble with high labor costs and a volatile energy sector, looking north things look just a little bit brighter as Nigeria sees almost a dozen new manufacturing plants preparing to launch by the end of the year, signaling a growing demand for new vehicles in this market. Now closer to South Africa, one once again, the car manufacturing market uh, might look bleak, but imported luxury cars still seem to be in demand. I recently spoke to Dina Govender. He's the manager uh, at BMW who's responsible for the very new and very expensive i8. I think what's important is there might be a much maligned group, but we shouldn't underestimate the power of the one percenters to move society along in a technological way. And the i8 is the spearhead, it's BMW's vision of what a sports car, of what emotive personal mobility of the future could look like, taking into account all the challenges we face uh, on the globe at the moment. So what am I buying? You buying a sports car, a traditional sports car with all the levers of emotions that pull people towards such cars, but with a view to sustainability in terms of utilization of scarce natural resources. To put an example, this is a car that will accelerate to 4 point, to not 100 in 4.4 seconds, but it does all of that with the fuel efficiency and the fuel economy of a small subcompact car, which stands at 2.1 liters per 100 kilometers. I mean, that is absolutely phenomenal. Well, joining me now for more insights is Gavin Mail. He's with the KPMG Automotive Sector and he's the head of that division, as well as Nicholas Dekana. He's the CEO of Imperial Fleet Management. And joining us from Lagos is Stephen Sutherland. He is the sales director for the rest of Africa at Mix Telematics. Gentlemen, thank you so much for making the time to join us. Gavin, I want to start with you and say that I'm not quite convinced about uh, a 1.8 million price tag on anything, whether it's a BMW i8, uh, or any other car for that matter. But maybe just give us a sense of what do consumers of uh, today and the future actually want when they're buying cars? Uh, the consumers these days are, are not concerned that much about electrified vehicles. Uh, and the forecast going forward is that they are not going to be big items and we're not going to see a lot of them on our roads in the short term. Even by 2020, we expect about one out of every 20 cars to have an alternative type of uh, fuel uh, um, system. Mm. So that is still very, very low. Um, I've been doing the global KPMG survey for 16 years now, and the trend has definitely changed dramatically in the recent number of years. So if we went back about 10 years uh, prior to the 2008 economic crisis, oil was at about $160 a barrel. Today we've got it below $60. So the, the, the drop off of the fuel price had a dramatic impact in terms of what the manufacturers were investing in. And so the, the estimated date when we were likely to see battery electrified vehicles and other types of vehicles has been pushed out further and further all the time. Nicholas, I, I would assume though that if you're looking at uh, commercial vehicles uh, and fleets in particular for big companies that fuel efficiency becomes a very, very important indicator. Absolutely. I mean, fuel efficiency is critical for in the choice of fleet vehicles. But I agree with Gavin completely. The, the reality is the fuel efficiency we're getting out of modern diesels is much better and much cheaper than what you can get out of an electrified vehicle. So not only is the, has the oil price dropped, but what you, feel is, you know, what you can see now is the real price of producing these vehicles with the batteries and with all the technology. And it's going to take many years before those two lines cross over. Mm. So I'd, say, I'd argue almost that fleets are going to be delayed versus uh, retail cars in getting into the electric vehicle space. Let's get the view uh, from Lagos. Uh, Stephen, let's bring you in. Uh, the, my two naysayers in Johannesburg are saying the consumer is not likely to latch on to this whole idea of electric cars anytime soon. What do you see coming out of the Nigerian market? Uh, Nasifu, um, yes, I'm inclined to agree, agree with both Gavin and Nicholas there. Obviously, in Nigeria, fuels are 
a little bit cheaper. But at the end of the day, and especially in the commercial sector where, where the battery operated vehicles is, is not so proliferant, but um, we're seeing that there is always a huge, huge demand for systems which are going to help them to run vehicles that are a lot more fuel efficient. Um, I think fuel's probably one of the, the top line items whenever we talk to any of the commercial operators. Cars of the future, staying with you, Stephen. Uh, what if it's not electric cars? What do you think, uh, you know, it tw in 20 years from now, uh, the average driver, whether it be in South Africa or Nigeria, is going to be driving? I, I do believe you probably find that the, the move to, to battery and electric or cleaner power is going to very much be driven by the younger generation, those that ones are probably a little bit more inclined to look on the green side. But um, obviously, as, as Nicholas has already mentioned, the diesel-operated vehicles, the fuel efficiency is quite amazing, some of them pretty close to battery. Uh, I think also, too, is it going to depend on, on, on recharging ability. So you can pick up fuel and diesel anywhere, but you might battle to find a recharge point for your vehicle. Uh, I'm not going to get into the electric, uh, the power debacle that we have in South Africa because I think we'll be talking for another hour. But Nicholas, we've spoken about what consumers want. Let's look at the broader market. And in particular, from a policy perspective in South Africa, we did see IPAP. Did it have the intended consequences? And how can the policy be better sharpened if we're going to see a, a deepening of the sector and more investment in the sector? Sorry. I think the manufacturing sa sector in South Africa is quite strongly reliant yeah. on, on these government subsidies. Uh, and that's probably a, a partly due to the fact that you need quite a strong industry in order for you to get cost efficiency uh, in, in, and scale out of the manufacturing sector. So it's still very dependent on that. And, and if anything, it's going to remain very dependent on those government subsidies. Other markets that are bigger than South Africa with similarly low duties. Remember, in South Africa, our duties are only 25% for imported mm. cars and slightly lower for European cars. When you have low duties like that, you really have to be very, very competitive. And the challenge for us is to remain competitive when our suppliers are largely offshore. So any, ex uh, you know, if there was to be any expansion of the APDP program, it would probably be in the section of uh, component suppliers. Mm. You can see evidence in like a market like Australia where the market's bigger than South Africa, it's nearly twice our size. And when they withdrew those subsidies progressively, uh, all of the local manufacturing left. Now what's Nigeria done in order to get some local manufacturing there is they still have uh, quite a high duty burden, mm. which means that imports are not particularly competitive. They've offered quite substantial subsidies to local plants, and they are now eliminating some of the used car imports which have been enormous in their markets. Mm. So their market's still much smaller than South Africa, maybe only 10% our size. Um, and, and they've got a long way to go before they'll have scale plants. Mm. And the big duty barrier is probably what's driving the fact mm. that there's local plants opening. We'll get to the Nigerian market in, mo in a moment to see uh, what is in store in terms of the potential to grow. But maybe let's come back to Gavin and let's talk about uh, the component parts manufacturing that Nicholas has just made mention of. Uh, to what extent are we really beginning to see the development of uh, such industries and, and in the broader secondary industry in South Africa? I'd, I'd like to add in a little bit on what Nicholas has said. So he's 100% right in terms of the APDP and the incentives. Mm. And we've been helping the Nigerian government with putting in a similar type of in, uh, arrangements uh, because there's nowhere in the world that manufacturing uh, can uh, exist and be profitable in its own right. Uh, and what worries me about small manufacturing, we, we have seven big manufacturers in our country, is the, is the volume you have to get. So you've got to have volumes to get efficiencies. Now we, we run our biggest plant here, will produce 220,000 cars a year uh, at full production. It's not running anywhere near that at the moment. And uh, our market is uh, for 650,000 cars a year, of which 70% are imported anyway. Uh, so we have big manufacturing here and we export more than 50% of what we make. Uh, the, the big German brands, they're actually exporting over 80% of what we make here to the, 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 the first world mm. countries. Our vehicles are top quality, uh, they're in high demand, made in South Africa, believe it or not. And they are, they, they, it, it works well. The global decision is made to make the car here yeah. for certain countries around the world. So that's why we have to produce cost-efficient, world-class vehicles. To your question on, on components, to me, we, we're seeing a lot of change in exchange rates at the moment. 
So the euro, which is the region we import most of our components from, is, is weakening drastically mm. because of the quantitative easing in the Western Europe region. But the dollar and the pound, which is where we export our vehicles to, we, we're getting weaker. Mm. So I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of perfect storm in that we can get components slightly cheaper than what we've used to, and we're selling our exports at a much higher mm. price. So it works well. I'm going to come back because I, I do want us to talk about local content requirements and how that has a play on the attractiveness of South Africa as an investment destination. But let's go to Lagos first. And Stephen, let's bring you into the conversation. Of course, there has been the collaboration between South Africa and Nigeria in terms of building an automotive manufacturing capacity in that particular market. Talk us through uh, some of uh, the key challenges and the successes that we've seen to date on the back of that collaboration. Uh, Nazifa, yeah, um, I think fr from our side, we've probably been doing business in, in Nigeria for about eight years, and it's definitely year on year one can see what a difference that's making. Uh, just if you have a look at the number of new vehicles on the market, and obviously this market's entry into leasing. And so the ability for, for commercial vehicles and for operators to now have access to new vehicles as opposed to running secondhand has definitely made a huge difference within the efficiency that a lot of them can now run their businesses. And I think that's probably the biggest, the biggest impact we've witnessed from our side. On that note, let's take a quick break. But when we come back, let's uh, deal with the issue of local content requirements and the kind of impact that this has on the attractiveness of a market as an investment destination. We'll see you straight after this short break. You're still watching Invest Africa. Now, tonight we're talking about the automotive industry in Africa. If you want to be a part of these conversations, you can certainly do that. You can tweet us at CNBC Africa. And of course, for this show, you use the hashtag Invest Africa. I still have my guest with me. That's Gavin Mail. He's uh, the head at, uh, of automotive sector at KPMG. Nicholas Dekana, he's the CEO of uh, Imperial Fleet Management. And still with us uh, from Lagos uh, is uh, Stephen Sutherland. He he is the sales director responsible for the rest of Africa at Mixed Telematics. Gentlemen, welcome back. Um, Gavin, let's, let's go into this issue of local content requirements because no doubt governments are trying to balance uh, foreign direct investment into the, in this sector whilst at the same time developing uh, local content industries or secondary industries broadly. Has South Africa got the right balance? I, I think we've still got a long way to go. Um, and I think the APDP is uh, encouraging local content and you, at the moment it's going through a review. Uh, that review process uh, should be finalized in the next couple of months and one of the outputs will be to address what's happening with the local content. Mm. So the issue with local content is uh, around duty neutrality. So if the OEM, the, the manufacturer, mm. can import components and not pay duty on them, then there's no reason that they should utilize locally produced components. Mm. We find ourselves in South Africa critically needing to create jobs. And at the manufacturer level, you don't create a lot of jobs. But the multiplier effect down the value chain through the components is, is massive. Yeah. So it's going to be a focus, I do believe, as soon as the revisions come through, in terms of making it more important to localize. Many of our top manufacturers already have local contents of above 50, 60, 70 percent on some of the newer models. So people are working together to make sure that when a new model is introduced, mm. we bring the right technology and tools in place to try and develop as many of the components mm. as we can here in South Africa. Stephen, let's get the Nigerian uh, comparison. Uh, as, as you've heard uh, from Gavin, giving us uh, the regulatory tensions that we have in South Africa in terms of balancing local content and foreign direct investment. How's the Nigerian government going about it? Nazipo, yeah. Um I think I can only obviously speak from, from our point of view and, and I think obviously they're looking, they're looking to the rest of Africa to bring as much of the, the important RP uh, into Nigeria so that everybody can learn from previous lessons, um, especially from, from 
those particular companies who have good experience within the rigors of operating within an African environment. And uh, so far, I think we've only had huge cooperation from their side in us being able to implement the type of technologies that we do so that they can gain the efficiencies and obviously the resulting safety from that. Nicholas, uh, in South Africa, if we ta look, take a look at the labor uh, sector, big headaches for automotive manufacturers. Uh, we saw an automotive strike and then we also saw a broader manufacturing strike across the board. To what extent has business been lost to South Africa because of the labor strife that we have in this market? So it's important to recognize that uh, plant investment decisions are very long-term decisions. And so you don't, unfortunately or fortunately, you don't see the impact of this, these mm. disturbances quickly. And I think that desensitizes a lot of people to how important it is to have a stable workforce in the automotive manufacturing sector. Long term, we cannot escape from the fact that this is a global product and we export to the rest of the world. Mm. And if we're unable to do that competitively, then it, the levels of government subsidy or duty protection or, or support that you need become unsustainable. So it's, um, good labor relations are absolutely critical yeah. in this industry. And I think that to the extent that the labor extracts higher and higher costs for themselves, they end up creating fewer and fewer opportunities for people to be in that industry. So the wage bill can only be a certain right. level. You can either have a few people highly paid or a lot of people at more realistic Gavin, numbers. Gavin, to what extent is this a South African specific problem as against something that we might see broadly in emerging markets? I think, it's, I think the South African issue is slightly different um, in that it's, it's a lot more uh, volatile and there's, there's less dialogue between labor and the leaders uh, mm. here. I mean, seven weeks or eight weeks that we had in 2013, uh, we won't live through that again. Um, and that's why the various players are heavily at work now, mm. making sure that in 2016, which is the next three year period, we're going to avoid that. If we don't avoid it, we're done. Mm. Um, we will not be able to export vehicles anywhere around the world uh, because they, they can't have an empty showroom for six weeks while our guys uh, picket or strike or mm. throw bricks or whatever might be going on. You raised an interesting point earlier, and I don't think it's only a labor that, that is here. Labor, yes, needs to get a, 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 a living wage, and, a, yeah. and unfortunately, the cost of living in South Africa has been growing far quicker for the lower income group than it has been for the higher income group. So they're feeling extreme pressure. Uh, but if there was proper dialogue and constructive dialogue, a lot of the issues that we're experiencing can be avoided. So instead of starting off at totally loggerheads and then not talking to each other, uh, I believe that with uh, more professional uh, approach to it, uh, consensus could be reached. But we can't price ourselves mm -hmm. out of the market. Uh, you know, our volumes, because they're so low and they're in right. global size, we produce very few vehicles here. You don't get those economies of scale. So we have a lot of things against us in terms of being world competitive. Stephen, no doubt as a South African uh, working in the Nigerian market, uh, you are well positioned to offer insights as to what not to do when it comes to labor relations. Uh, talk to us just through uh, the on the ground environment uh, when it comes to labor and the automotive sector in Nigeria and whether there are any nuances or comparisons that can be drawn between the South African context and the Nigerian context. Yes, Nasipu, I think just, just maybe picking up a little bit from what Gavin has already said, um, as, as South African producers, we obviously need to be cognizant of the fact that the rest of Africa is more than willing uh, to, to pick up um, anywhere, and especially within the automotive manufacturing. And they've definitely got the labor on the ground. Uh, they definitely got the numbers by, by way of volume, um, and therefore also well positioned to, to compete with us. I think. Um, if we, if we need to seriously go back and sometimes have a look at the way that we do things, I think labor relations is key, as, as was already mentioned by Nicholas. And we need, we need to watch our P's and Q's because um, they can compete with us quite easily. Let's talk about uh, uh, the different models that are coming to the continent. I mean, Nicholas, um, we've seen uh, Indian models, uh, Asian models broadly, the likes of your Tatas really beginning to make a dent in the continent in terms of the kind of volumes that we are seeing. Are we finding that these are, are growing and they have no competition or are there other competitive trends that we should be taking cognizance of in terms of uh, outside models in the commercial vehicle space in particular coming into the African continent? 
Sure. So I think, you know, I mean, what you've seen in the African market is this allowance of a lot of used cars coming into the market. Mm. And that's been very difficult to compete with. So the pricing is very difficult. Brands like Tata Commercials have done actually quite well. And they've done well by supporting their product with quite an extensive after sales market. And interestingly, that's critical in South Africa and in the rest of Africa is that you can't sell a product and then walk away from it. I think the market maturity is moving on to the stage where if a, a customer or a company wants to buy a model, what they want is some assurance of after sales and parts support. Mm. And that will continue as the duty barriers uh, reduce and more new models are allowed into these markets. Then what you'll find is customers get used to better and better levels of service. At the moment, there's a real economic decision why your average consumer in Africa buys a pre-owned vehicle with no warranty and no support. And that's simply because the duties are just so incredibly high that it can't afford to buy a new vehicle. Mm. It's not because the desire is not there. And so those consumers, as those duty barriers come down, what you find is they are happy to go into a market where they get a warranty and after sales support. On the passenger vehicle side, uh, Gavin, what are the major trends we're seeing in terms of the dominant models that have entrenched themselves and perhaps the new players that are coming to the market and shaking up the competition a bit? I think what's interesting is that the, the latest KPMG Global survey which came out this week is that Honda Kia is expected to be the biggest growth model around the world. So from a brand point of view, they are seen as, as, as the, the biggest growth. There's obviously a lot of other big players. So you've got your Toyota, Volkswagen, and General Motors as your three big brands. But the focus then also in terms of the survey is that the smaller segment is where the growth is going to right. come. And the bigger segment, the SUVs and the bigger vehicles uh, in the passenger side are going to see a decrease. Now that is on the, on the back of the fuel efficiency on the mm. price uh, as well as regulation in terms of trying to cut down the CO2 emissions. Mm. And so especially in the mature first world, the, the, the bigger vehicles, the, the, the executives that were interviewed are saying that there's going to be a big decline in the next five years in terms of that. I suspect with the fuel price coming down yeah. uh, globally, we're not going to see that happen as quickly as, as, as expected. But the long term is bigger vehicles, not as popular. I want to come back to the, the, the key narrative that's coming out from executives that you've captured in this report. But before we do that, uh, Stephen, let's come back to you and also just get a sense. Uh, we've spoken about entry level vehicles uh, and that was Gavin in particular and sort of juxtapositioning that against the higher end uh, vehicles. Talk to us about the luxury car market. Oftentimes in Nigeria, we're told that uh, there's increased com consumption of champagne and a really huge asset inspirational desire uh, to really live the good life. To what extent are we actually seeing that also reflected in the automotive uh, sector? Yanisibo, I think from, from what you see on the roads, if you're going to use that as the, as the point from which or point of departure, is you're obviously seeing uh, a lot more of the larger, more luxury, especially SUVs. I think a lot of that is also not only dictated from a status perspective, but uh, road conditions, especially when it rains. A lot of them moving towards the larger vehicles so that they can, can negotiate uh, some of the obstructions that, that go into place. A lot more of the luxury vehicles you're seeing, and as I said before, you're seeing a lot more of the, of the newer vehicles of the later models starting to appear uh, on the Nigerian market. Mm, that's quite interesting. I want to quote something uh, that, uh, that came out of that report, and maybe you can just justify it for us. It says here that uh, the report shows that short-term market issues are still taking priority over strategic innovations. Uh, what does that say about the kind of executive leadership we have in the sector? I think what it's referring to is the very uh, challenging uh, digital space that the consumers, especially the younger consumers, are demanding in their vehicle. So we're finding that what the younger generation are wanting is everything they can do at home, they want to be able to do in their car. So if it's internet, if it's Facebook, if it's uh, movies, if it's um, talking to, to anybody, and it even moves as far as recently we've heard a lot about the, the driverless car. Mm. So you asked a question, I think, to Stephen earlier about, you know, what, who's gonna, what cars are we going to drive in 20 years? Well, if, if things work out the way they, get, they, they predicted, we're not going to be driving. We're going to go from point A to point B, and our car's going to do that automatically for us. 
Well, on that note of Facebook cars and driverless drives, I think that's where we'll wrap it. Thank you so much for making the time to join us. A very big thank you to my guest, Gavin Mail, KPMG Automotive Sector Head, Nicholas Dakana, the CEO of Imperial Fleet Management, and Stephen Sutherland, Sales Director for the rest of Africa at Mix Telematics. Please remember that you can send us your comments, any suggestions or questions that you have uh, about the show and uh, that you'd like to make for the show. The details are on your screen. For myself and the Invest Africa team, it's goodbye.